Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne. This is Wilms Front. Brought to you by the Unshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. Well, it is us Melburnians who've uh, suffered the worst uh, throughout uh, Australia with the pandemic and the lockdowns in other states and territories. Border closures and arbitrary rules are still crippling. Uh, people's daily lives, uh, business viability, and are tearing families apart. Uh, the decade of the 2020s in Australia will be the toughest in our nation's history, certainly in, in my lifetime, even if the coronavirus is eliminated or a vaccine is found. Uh, the economic and fiscal devastation uh, by the associated lockdowns will be felt by ordinary Australians for many years to come. So how can Australia bounce back from this horror year and get back on the path uh, to freedom and, and prosperity? Well, I thought that George Christensen would be a good man to uh, ask, uh, given that uh, he can help influence uh, federal government uh, policy. He's been the, the Liberal National Party of Queensland member for Dawson since uh, 2010, uh, which uh, takes in the, the central Queensland city of uh, Mackay. He sits in the, the National Party room in Canberra, and he's also this year launched his own podcast uh, this year, uh, Conservative One, as part of the, the Good Source Network. So, George, uh, I'll properly welcome you to Wilmsfront. Thank you. And uh, before we begin, Tim, uh, I've had, uh, as you know, some uh, uh, two-bit journalist profile. He found that I actually liked the Unshackled Facebook page um, and accused you guys of being neo-Nazi. So I have to do this checklist. Uh, are you a neo-Nazi? No. Okay, that's fine. Are you a racist? No. No, okay, that's fine. Do you spread conspiracy theories? No. Okay, no, that's fine. But you did wear some funny T-shirt about Pinochet. Yes, yes, I do yeah, have okay. that T-shirt. Okay. <laughs> Three out of four, it's fine. Yeah. It's, it's okay, it's okay. Yeah, we can go ahead. We can, yeah. we can continue the conversation now because uh, I, I can now not be, um, what's the word, uh, Guilty by association. Oh, yeah, but you could be guilty of my six or seven degrees of, of, of separation. Yeah, well. And, uh, look, you're guilty of uh, of this blatant um, promotion as well <laughs> from mining country. I, I, I heard that uh, apparently uh, the, the Palaszczuk Labor government, they, they suddenly uh, support uh, coal now as well because it's uh, Queensland wow. election time. That's right. They're all, uh, <laughs> it's hilarious actually, to see these people who stood up with green protesters, shaking their hands, accepting their petitions, um, singing Kumbaya with them and dancing to their ukuleles, um, you know, and, and saying that we listen to the green movement, you know, our government respects the green movement. And now an election's on, they realise that there's a big problem and they're all out there in high vis and hard hats, uh, pretending that they're for the mining industry. I just had locally here the Premier fly into town and announce the uh, approval of a coal mine that it just so happened was approved over 12 months ago. Uh, so re-announcing approvals to try and show that they're um, pro-mining. It's really, really, truly bizarre. Uh, that's awful well, spin of the worst kind and, and taking the voters for, for mugs. But uh, definitely uh, the, the, this year, uh, voters, well, particularly in Victoria, with uh, uh, a lot of Victorians uh, thrown out of work and, and put under the house arrest, they've got a lot of time on their hands to be more informed about uh, politics, which is the, mm -hmm. the silver lining. Yeah, well... I feel very badly for all those people in Victoria, uh, Victoria and Queensland. It's just been absolutely shocking. Um, Victoria just, uh, they have really just trampled all over freedom and liberty. Uh, and there's always a reason for it. There's always some reason for it, but they've just trampled all over it. And in Queensland now, with the shutdown of the borders, literally, uh, if I get time after I finish this interview with you tonight, I've got to call a woman down in Victoria whose mother died 
in Mackay. Yes, uh, I saw you post she, on Facebook about that. Another heartbreaking story. Well, well, it gets even worse now is that she informs uh, my office today that um, they got the approval. They got the approval the day after the mother died. And uh, I'll just um, I'll read a section for I'm not going to name names, but I'll read a, a section from the message. It's just it's, it's just dreadful. Uh, she says to me, uh, our efforts have been in vain. We finally, after eight days, did get an answer from the health department late yesterday, but my mother had already passed away earlier that day. They gave us approval to fly to Queensland, though, uh, but we would have to quarantine at a government-approved hotel at our own expense for 14 days. We are unable to self-quarantine at my brother's house, as requested. To add salt in our already wounded hearts, we were not and the word not was placed in capital letters, allowed to leave quarantine for the funeral. Absolutely and utterly insane. How do you, can I just ask, how do you, obviously you're receiving a lot of these uh, correspondence, uh, how do you get through it emotionally? Because I know I was saying in my, my introduction, even though it's, uh, it's part of my job to keep my viewers informed about what the the new arbitrary rules are in uh, Victoria and what Dan's decided. There's only so much I myself can take mentally from it. And I'm one of the, the lucky ones. How does it impact you? And particularly, obviously, you have staff in your office to, to receive those calls and emails. That must also break their hearts as well. Uh, it does have an impact, uh, particularly at the frontline staff in the office. Um, uh, but more than anything, um, because I, I went through my own mother's death uh, in recent memory, it makes me very angry, actually, mm. to think that um, that's the emotion that comes out of me, anger. And I think, boy, oh boy, I am so lucky it wouldn't it wasn't me because I would be in jail. Like, you know, sorry. I'd say, well... To whoever it was that was stopping me from going, you're just going to have to take me and physically put me behind bars because uh, I'm going. The only way I'm not going is if someone stops me. Uh, so that's how angry the the uh, the behaviour of, of the government makes me feel. Now, obviously, next week in, in Canberra, uh, it's the, 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 the federal budget, uh, October 6th. Uh, I should ask you first, uh, will you be present in Canberra? Uh, well, no, I won't be, but uh, not because of any lockdowns, because uh, uh, recently I found that my uh, nose is full of basal cell carcinoma, so I'm having one of my local GPs here uh, put a blowtorch to my nose to remove all the skin cancers. But uh, anyway, uh, I'll, be, uh, I'll be zooming in or, uh, I don't know, WebExing into the... Uh, parliamentary proceedings earlier in the week. Well, I'm glad that you can still get that uh, treatment because obviously with the, the stage four lockdown uh, in, in Melbourne, elective surgery was uh, suspended uh, again and people don't stop getting ailments or are sick from, from other things uh, during right. this uh, pandemic. So uh, that's certainly reassuring that uh, in Queensland you can get that. Is it still... I don't even like this term, elective surgery. It's basically non-urgent surgery. Well, that's that's really what uh, uh, elective means. I mean, elective doesn't mean I've decided to uh, go and get this done. It's often some painful ailment that people have that they're getting um, getting seen to and uh, been waiting a long time to get, get it seen to. And now, the, the, obviously, the, the, the final uh, budget deficit uh, figure uh, will be announced by Josh Frydenberg uh, next, next week. Uh, the, the deficits uh, that have been reported in the media is $83 billion for this year and $180 billion for, for next year. When I hear those figures, it leaves me co convulsing because, well, I'm 30 years old this is going to be with me, uh, my debt for the, the rest of my life. Uh, you're relatively young as well, so, so you'll, be, you, you'll be around uh, to, to see, well, uh, hopefully to see some of this debt being paid off. But how does it make you feel when you hear these massive uh, deficits being uh, projected? Because 
That's got to be paid back. Uh, it's borrowed from somewhere. Yeah. Um, look, what worries me the most is actually um, that there just doesn't seem to be much concern about this fact out in the public sphere. Um, and, you know, the day of reckoning always comes uh, where you have to pay and uh, the money just doesn't um, come out of thin air. We borrow that money uh, and uh, the people we borrow it from are mainly people in China and the Middle East. And, uh, you know, uh, look, uh, the only thing that um, makes me a little bit more... Um, I guess I'm not I'm I'm not in the sta stage of self-flagellation over it because uh, uh, the reality is the whole world has had to go further into debt, and the situation I I, I guess to a, uh, to some degree was if we didn't do measures so didn't undertake certain measures that there would be massive economic harm right now. But I think that uh, probably like you and a lot of listeners the economic harm was uh, exacerbated by government actions and prolonged longer and it's still being prolonged longer than what is really necessary and um you know so uh, the government's causing the harm principally state government sadly and uh, uh the federal government's having to pick up the compensatory tab for uh, all of the harm that's being caused uh, which has exposed this uh, massive uh, imbalance and, and brokenness in our Federation, and is that why the uh, the Morrison government has been so firm that uh, JobKeeper will end in in March twenty one? Is this basically to put in place a deadline for all the states and territories? You need to reopen fully by that time. Open up your borders. That's it. There'll be no more uh, support from us. You're not going to uh, uh, tr uh, try and uh, manipulate us any further. <laughs> Um, look, I'm not sure that the thinking has been along the lines of uh, of using it as a political weapon, but I would just say that the thinking is obviously that uh, wage supported wage structures just can't continue forever. I mean, we can't have a situation where the government is simply going to pay uh, everyone's wages or a proportion of everyone's wages. I mean, that, that's just uh, in insanity to think that that can continue. But, you know... <laughs> There's been a slight reduction in in the uh, in the wage supports uh, of of JobKeeper, and it's tightened up a bit in terms of um, you know you actually have to prove that you've got that sort of uh, negative impact on your business uh, before your workers will get uh, the benefit of JobKeeper. But we've got Labor MPs that are running around saying, "Oh my goodness, they're cutting businesses. They're uh, they're cutting them from JobKeeper." Well, the only way you're going to be cut, uh, so to speak is if your business is actually not doing badly that's a good thing that's a good thing um but it just seems that the labor party right now have this mentality that uh now we want this job keeper to be in place even for businesses that aren't doing badly and i'm not sure how long they want it to continue on for uh, but it's got to come to an end sooner or later it's got to come to an end and but so too do the negative impacts. Mm. That's the, that's the thing. And I just just uh, sorry to, to butt in there, but you know, let's just look at some of the key facts. The virus, the the, the China the China flu, uh, the Wuhan coronavirus has got a nine hundred ninety seven out of a thousand survival rate. Uh, these are the uh, the inconvenient facts. Uh, we know that the CDC says that um, uh, the American experience, which is uh, you know, if you believe what you read in the media, being you know terrible and everything, but the the American experience has has been that only six percent of of deaths uh, actually were solely caused by coronavirus. Uh, that uh, the other ninety four percent there were comorbidities of two or more. Um, so it probably brought on death that may have happened at some point anyway. Uh, and then we've got. Um, you got the the other thing that come out the world health organization saying that it's very rare for people who are asymptomatic uh, to to spread the virus now um they tried to come out and backtrack on that because they had a whole heap of 
people arguing against them or telling them they shouldn't have said that. And they said, oh, no, no, we shouldn't have said very rare. Uh, what we should have said was just the facts that we've done. We've got a few studies out there. One of the studies showed that zero people, zero, uh, who are asymptomatic uh, with coronavirus actually transmitted the virus. The other one, which was at the high end, showed 17%. So we got a virus that um, has got a high survivability rate, a virus that mainly kills people that have pre-existing morbidities uh, of, of at least two, a, a, and a, a virus which, by and large, isn't normally spread by people who don't have symptoms. So given those three facts, and they're not opinions, these are not George Christensen's opinions, these are empirical facts. Given these empirical facts, can't we manage this? Can't we manage it? And what you've just said, that's also been uh, admitted by uh, our own uh, Chief Health Officer down here in Victoria, Dr. Uh, Brett Sutton. Uh, but uh, it's very clear now uh, that uh, obviously he doesn't have uh, much influence in the, well, they're, they're being referred to as uh, captain's calls by, by Dan Andrews, I more crudely refer to them as, as dictatorial uh, decrees. Yeah, he's certainly, uh, Brett Sutton, a, a, better, a better person than your chief health officer up there, uh, Dr. Uh, Jeanette Young, who seems to be more than willing to basically carry the can for, for Anastasia Palaszczuk and uh, own all these uh, cruel and uh, illogical uh, decisions about uh, border exemptions. Yeah, so so the story goes that uh, the decisions are not being made by our elected officials, they're being made by the Chief Health Officer in Queensland. Uh, and I've got to say that, um, look, you know, I don't care who's making it, if it's, if it's Jeanette Young, Jeanette Young, here's the thing, you've kept a woman away from seeing her dying mother uh, in my electorate. Uh, you know, but the reality is that the Premier... Uh, could have overruled that she didn't and whoever's making the decisions it's heartless and it really flies in the face of these three very manageable facts about the virus and i also didn't know she was also the state's well chief uh, economics officer because she said the reason that she had granted exemptions for uh, the, the <laughs> afl and uh, tom hanks to to come into to queensland and uh, quarantine yeah. in a resort hub is because they bring in a lot of money to the state yeah well uh and that really rankled people look there's a lot of people that have been amped up by the fear that's just been spread through the mainstream media where we oh you know 10 cases today or two cases today and oh there's a new front that's opened all this sort of um uh, real real frightening stuff like the coronavirus is around the corner waiting to pounce on you um so a lot of people have been caught up in that fear uh, that's been spread by the mainstream media and so i will admit there's a few people who are saying oh no it's good that the borders have get, got kept shut in queensland but one thing that's almost universal is the fact that there's condemnation for these two rules uh, one rule for the rich and famous and powerful and another rule for us everyday plebs, you know, like uh, who, who can't go and see a dying parent, who uh, can't go and attend a parent's funeral. Uh, like that girl from Canberra who had to be dressed head to toe in what looked like the kind of outfit you'd, you know, you'd go and visit Chernobyl in. Yeah. Uh, to go and see... Uh, the body of a dead parent like so so now uh, a, a dead person's going to catch the virus off off the mother i mean it's just really yeah. weird stuff when i hear the because i'm in melbourne at the moment where we're living by the what are the the new daily case numbers but uh, certainly for a lot of victorians now where uh, more and more Victorians, it's uh, when we hear the new daily cases, it's not, we're, we're not actually thinking, oh no, coronavirus is about, we're thinking, oh no, uh, that's more time that we're going to be deprived of our human rights and civil liberties. That's, that's more and more the attitude 
now here in uh, Victoria. And obviously, we have had massive uh, community transmission here. I know people who've uh, gotten uh, uh, the virus, and yes, it, it wasn't pleasant, but they uh, recovered. Uh, that certainly hasn't uh, changed their uh, point of view that, yeah, these lockdowns can't go on forever. We can't uh, eliminate the virus completely, which seems to be the, uh, the secret policies of the state and territory leaders rather than the official uh, national cabinet policy of suppression. Well, it's not so secret. I mean, that, that obviously is the strategy that they're deploying. I mean, uh, you heard it once, you heard it a thousand times, the old saying of let's flatten the curve or we're flattening the curve. Uh, that meant that we're getting transmission rates down to a manageable level, not that we're getting rid of the virus. You, you can't get rid of a virus. It is viral. Um, you know, imagine a politician or a chief medical officer for that matter standing up and explaining to the public that this year we're going to stop the flu we're going to stop the flu there will be no influenza in australia uh, i mean people would probably think they're nuts i think they're smoking what they're growing and yet um here they're up there acting as if and i'm going to say getting a fair bit of traction because most people don't understand uh, coronavirus, you name, it's a new term for them. Um, uh, you know, it's a new, a new experience for everyone, a pandemic. Um, so they're just believing what they're hearing and what they're hearing through the mainstream media, sadly. But I think that eyes are starting to open now. Facts are emerging. People are questioning. People are saying uh, heartless decisions being made. People are saying freedoms being whittled away. And they're just saying, uh, hang a tick, even if there is some virus, even if all of that stacks up, it this really, this, this cure is worse than the disease. I think definitely in March, where we didn't know much about their uh, coronavirus yeah, or COVID-19, because who would trust a thing that comes out of uh, China and uh, it's... Uh, uh, it, it, it's uh, sympathizers in the World Health Organization. So I know you uh, were, 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 were rightly uh, skeptical about uh, what, uh, what was the truth about this uh, uh, virus. And so we all uh, agreed with the idea to, to flatten the curve so we could learn more about the virus, our hospital system would it be, uh, be overwhelmed? But we know much more about this uh, virus and its impact six months later than we did back in March. Yeah. So, Tim, the, the reception there was a little bit jittery, but I think I picked up what you were saying that, uh, you know, basically earlier this year when the pandemic sort of broke out, uh, there was a high level of probably justified fear because we really didn't know what the hell was going to happen with this virus, but now we've sort of experienced it for a while and we know what the facts are. And and that's right, you know, um, the, uh, I think it was the Imperial College out of London was saying that this was going to be, you know, just chaos writ large, that people are going to be dying left, right and centre, that, uh, and it all didn't, it didn't come to pass. It didn't, thank, thank goodness it didn't come to pass. Uh, the predictions just uh, didn't happen. There's now, um, you know, but but also what what shouldn't have come to pass was this shouldn't have gotten out of China at all. Uh, we know for a fact that uh, China actually locked down its internal borders to stop people from Wuhan going into, say, uh, neighbouring states, going to Beijing, and at the same time let people from Wuhan come to all four corners of the planet, including Australia. Uh, so basically, that is an indication that China, the Communist Party of China, actually knew that uh, this was a problem. This disease, this virus, was transmissible, and uh, they didn't want it transmitted anywhere else in China. But they were happy for it to be transmitted elsewhere in the world. There's an article that just popped up the other day uh, in, I think it was Tablet Magazine, and I can't recall off the top of my head the author, but. Uh, the premise that they put forward was actually very interesting. More than just a, a you know, passing theory, there was some substance to it. There was uh, some evidence they put forward to say that 
all the things that stoked up the fear, and actually, just as an aside, can I say that I haven't subscribed to this view um, until I read that article, and suddenly it dawned upon me if indeed some of the facts in this article bear out to be correct, and I think that they, they probably will be. Uh, the images we see of people falling over in the streets in China, the images that uh, really alarmed people, even the doctor who died of it that had his ID card held up um, in a photo, all of that was actually released by Chinese Communist Party organs. Are you going to say, like, why were they putting this out? And then they say the spread of them uh, through the social, through social media, through Twitter and Facebook and the rest of it, um, was all done by well, not all, but largely done by Chinese bots. Uh, and it was then the question was put: Was this a massive disinformation campaign to make the world think that the zombie apocalypse was coming with this virus or something? You know, uh, and then it went to Italy and. China has a very cosy relationship with the Italian government and was in there telling them, no, no, you've got to lock down harder. You've got to lock down harder. You've just got to suppress the populace, basically. This is what you've got to do to control it. This is what we did. And so Italy did that, and then that became the template for the rest of the world. And, you know, it is a, this is a bit of a conspiracy theory, and we said at the start we went into conspiracy theories. But, you know, you've got to, you've got to ask the question, is, did this... Did this did this happen? Did China make a uh, shoot ourselves in the foot by causing the rest of the world to lock down their economies, to shut down their economies while they went and prevailed? Um, did they did they make us, you know, the old saying about uh, they won the war without firing a shot? Well, did they win the war by making ourselves sh shoot ourselves in the, in the feet? We don't know, but it's, uh, it's certainly an interesting observation. Well, I've certainly uh, learnt a lot more about uh, China's uh, new uh, new types of, of warfare over over the past year, uh, particularly their their, their foreign interference uh, campaigns. And yes, it is it, it's yeah. not a traditional type of a a conflict or or, or, or operation. It, this is. Obviously, the the, the the 21st century, there's uh, much more different uh, avenues of, of of affecting your adversaries. Yeah, yeah. China uh, looks at everything. There's a book. I've got it over there, actually, uh, on one of the shelves behind me, um, uh, called Unrestricted Warfare, which um, uh, really people like... Uh, Stephen Bannon, uh, telling everyone that you must read this because this is this is the playbook. This is the Chinese Communist Party playbook uh, for um, for our modern era. And um, what it boils down to is that everything is to be viewed through the prism of warfare. That you you, know, you have information warfare, you have economic warfare. Uh, you use every different measure. Uh, to to basically subjugate your opponents, and um, you know, we look what's going on with economic coercion involving our nation in China. Well, that's happening. So it is quite alarming that uh, that, that China has these um, has these beliefs, that China has the drives, and China has the uh, certainly the logistics and the ability to carry out those um, warfare activities. We don't see it as warfare, but it really it is. I mean, they they th think about it. I mean, we know that China hacked uh, uh, government uh, websites, government um, government intranets. Uh, uh, that China caused a mass cyber attack in our country. Uh, what sort of country does that to a country that it's supposedly friendly with? You mentioned that uh, obviously uh, the Western world has has followed the the, the China uh, and Italy lockdown model, and of course uh, nobody uh, has uh, followed it almost to the letter than oh, the, the the state of uh, Victoria, where 
we should not remember that mm. uh, those uh, nine public housing towers uh, in inner Melbourne, Dan Andrews put them under what I described no, yeah. as a Wuhan Shocking. level five lockdown. We should we should never forget and. The, uh, the demographics of those towers are supposedly the, uh, the, the type of people that uh, Dan Andrews cares about and he put them under literal house arrest. They, they weren't allowed to, to leave their apartments given uh, food rations and it's, it's just gotten worse. Uh, since then, I mean, you, uh, you, you've seen it all uh, happen with the uh, incitement uh, charges against the, the, the protest organisers and the, uh, mm. the Victoria Police uh, wearing those uh, 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 aggressively and in some cases brutally uh, shutting down uh, the, the anti-lockdown rallies where they didn't lay a finger on uh, Black Lives Matter uh, in yeah. June, it is it is scary. Uh, it is. I, I say to people who uh, are reading the uh, Victorian lockdown on paper, yes, it is as bad as you see it on uh, filtered through your your social media or news. Yeah, I, I'd hate I'd hate to live in Victoria. I'd hate to live in Victoria, principally because. Uh, like I said before, I get angry about um, hearing about the things in Queensland and it, 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 in people being restricted from coming to see dying parents and that. And if it was me, I'd probably be in jail. If I was living in Victoria, even as a member of parliament, I'd probably be in jail because I just wouldn't accept uh, some of the anti-freedom and anti-liberty things that we're seeing going on in the state of Victoria. It's crazy. Um, you know, look, and to call a spade a spade, I mean, the, the people in those towers you're talking about uh, were mainly migrants uh and they were mainly uh, from what i understand uh, there were there are a lot of, of muslim australians uh in that uh, in those towers so uh, the story goes that um you know linked to the debacle we saw in the hotel quarantine um, management or mismanagement uh, we had uh security guards that fraternized with infected um Fraternised is the very politically correct term. Fraternised with uh, 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 tourists that were in those hotels, um, and some of those security guards might have been of uh, Muslim uh, faith themselves, and ended up going to uh, big indoor uh, celebrations, uh, Islamic celebrations. That um, I'm not sure whether they were allowed or not allowed under the law. Uh, but the reality was that they went on and I could say that they, they I could probably hazard a guess that they went on with a lot of knowledge that they were going on. And you can't organise big uh, religious celebrations indoor without some advertising on social media or all the rest of it. So they were allowed to go on and please turn a blind eye to that. At the same time, you couldn't go to a church and you've got these stupid rules now in some states where if you do go to a church, um, you can't sing, sing a hymn. Mm. But so, so, so political correctness uh, probably caused, I mean, mismanagement caused the stuff up to begin with, and then political correctness caused the further stuff up by turning a blind eye to uh, Muslim gatherings where it spread rapidly throughout the community. Um, then just to lock people down in their homes, I'm sorry, again, I couldn't care less what your excuse is that um, you just do not take away people's freedom like that. That was wrong. That was wrong. And obviously the part of Victorian Parliament hasn't uh, sat uh, much this year because, well, a, a lot of us have, have seen just how much uh, premiers can uh, be dictators with the uh, the use of these emergency powers, which passed through parliaments uh, many years ago. Yeah. Uh, Dan Andrews, he only returns to parliament if he wants to pass more emergency measures, like the, the six-month extension to the, the state of emergency powers. He got that through with uh, support of Fiona Patton, uh, Animal Rights, uh, Animal Justice Party, and uh, the, the Greens now is trying to get this uh, omnibus uh, bill through, which I'm sure you uh, have heard much much about it that i thought it was just he could appoint any public servant to be an authorized officer and detain anyone indefinitely but it actually can be 
yeah. anyone. Uh, so it actually is like the the old uh, Stasi uh, in East East Germany, where anyone potentially at any place could be an informant. Yeah, um, look, it's it's uh, really really anti freedom. I don't know what else you can you can say about it. I mean, people, you, you tell the story about what's going on in Victoria and the laws, and people actually don't believe you. They think, oh, you're just making that up. It possibly can't be true. But it is true. They've designated authorised officers and given them the same powers of the police, probably greater powers. <laughs> and now it's not about what you might have done. It's what that authorised officer might think you could do. And so they've got the ability to... Uh, detain you, arrest you, perhaps even imprison you um, based on the likelihood uh, in their judgment, this authorised officer, not a policeman, but an authorised officer, in their judgment, uh, what they think you might do. They think you might be a risk to public health. They think that you might uh, go against um, health orders. Well, you're going to be locked up. I don't know how you adjudicate that. Um, because if that goes to a court uh, and the person's arguing, those, you know, I've been in, uh, unfairly arrested or unfairly imprisoned, uh, well, how's the judge going to interpret uh, a law that says that 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 the person can be detained, can be arrested, simply because someone, an authorised officer, thinks they might potentially do something wrong? Well... Anyone could get done for that. And again, look, it may be in the vast majority of cases, it may be used for um, all of the so-called right reasons, but you just don't do it. It's a thin edge of the wedge. That is, is harming freedom, which is such a precious thing. You don't realise how precious it is because we've nearly always had it in Australia. Harming freedom and uh, to me, that just means that the cure is worse than the disease. I know uh, many people have also uh, expressed concern about a uh, uh, new uh, ASIO uh, amendment bill that's currently before the, 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 the federal parliament, which would allow more surveillance uh, questioning of, of younger people. And... Obviously, uh, Peter Dutton, as, as Home Affairs Minister, I trust him uh, to exercise or oversee such powers appropriately. But the thing is, heaven forbid, if there was Home Affairs Minister Christina Keneally, what would she do with such a power? She'd probably... Oh, your camera's just gone off for a moment. I, I see that. I'm sorry. Uh, she, I've had... Uh... My, my screen went blank for a moment there. I panicked. Mm. Uh, but uh, I was going on to say that, uh, well, uh, Christina Keneally, uh, she sees right-wing uh, extremists uh, everywhere. She'd probably try to, well, she, she, she's uh, tried to uh, uh, do whatever is in her power to, to shut down or sabotage the, the CPAC uh, Australia events. Uh, uh, such power in the hands of, of her as, as Home Affairs Minister, that would be frightening. Yeah, yeah. Look, you, you you may be right on that. Look, I I got to say that um, every time laws have been put in front of me uh, as a as a member of the House of Representatives that look at further further surveillance powers by agencies of the state, whether it's the federal police or whether it's ASIO, I always ask questions. And look, I I, I, I may not have completely come up to speed with what's proposed around ASIO, but uh, if it was something that there was some laws that recently were were put through, and if they are those laws, I think that at the end of the day, they still need warrants. Uh, and, and to me, that that's, that's a safeguard. I mean, you know, to search someone's house, <laughs> unless it's Victoria now, mm. but to search someone's house normally... Um, you would need a warrant of the court. And that is only issued when a, a judge, a person that's versed in the law, that should be um, well-versed in, in you know, matters relating to privacy and freedom, uh, actually says on the balance of odds, uh, there's a high likelihood this person has done something wrong 
and so we're going to allow the authorities to go in and search their home. Now, I would say that we have that. We've had that for a long time in Australia, that standing arrangement. So searching your home, searching your computer, searching your email account, searching, um, I don't know, your, your mobile phone device, all of that probably uh, uh, would fall under the same category. And just because we expand the laws in terms of what's covered with that search, the principles just need to remain in effect that um, in order for such a search and a breach of, of a person's privacy to go ahead, it should have a safeguard. So I've been satisfied that up until, um, well, well, for every law that I've seen, that there has been that safeguard put in place. Uh, in uh, Victoria, it, it's it's getting to the stage now where if you uh, are talking about uh, human rights, you're declared a, a conspiracy theorist. Uh, uh, that, that's how insane things are getting here. And we've, we've seen uh, Dan Andrews in a, a, a moment of, or you could say, frustration or snap, where he said, if I hear one more thing about uh, uh, hu human rights, and he says it's, uh, it's about human life. And I uh, remember one of your, your colleagues at the, the Good Source, uh, James McPherson, made, made the point. Uh, yeah. uh, Dan Andrews, obviously, uh, he, he, doesn't give, he hasn't given much consideration to the, uh, the quality uh, of, of human life, uh, because often uh, progressives talk about uh, uh, dying with dignity but, uh, in regards to, to euthanasia. I think about all the uh, uh, hundreds of Victorians who've uh, died from the uh, coronavirus here in Victoria. There's been no dignity in, in their death. Mo uh, most of them have died alone uh, in a room with a literally a bunch of, of faceless strangers. The, the families are not allowed to, to see them, to, to say goodbye. And then the funerals are, are limited to, to 10. Uh, this is, I call it basically the, the double mm. whammy mm. here. Yeah. Um, look, that, that, that's, that's right, what you've just said there. That's, that's, uh, I, but I think there's almost a bit of a, a, a false narrative that goes on. I've heard a few people running this line of, oh, why do we always think about the economy? Aren't lives more important than the economy? Um, you know, or we're protecting lives, putting lives ahead of other things. Well, really? Uh, I just go back to those key points again, um, you know, the virus is mainly survivable, 997 out of a thousand or thereabouts, uh, that you have to have pre-existing comorbidities in the majority of cases uh, to actually die from it. And also um, the, the other fact that if you are not really, uh, if you're not symptomatic, you're unlikely to be spreading it. Um, those are three knowns. And so, uh you know what what are we what are we protecting if there's an asymptomatic person who most likely doesn't have it being locked up in their house what is that wh whose life is in danger from that person i mean it's a false narrative and it's also a false narrative to talk about the economy as if it's something separate to human lives mm. An economy isn't some artificial device that's controlled by bankers with levers. An economy is uh, 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 humans interacting with each other, trading with each other, humans uh, doing things for the benefit of one another. And when you shut that down, when you essentially say, uh, no, actually, we're going to end this interaction. We're going to end the societal interaction of humans in order to protect human lives. Well, what you do for a great degree of the public who find meaning in what they contribute to society is that you take away their will to live. And i got to tell you, I know that for a fact. Uh, I won't name names, but there's a little old lady uh, that I know who all the time goes to work at her local church op shop. She's the queen of it, right? That's her meaning. And uh, I was, I didn't hear it directly, but I was told by someone that she was almost in tears when she was told that it has to shut down. And the thought was, what she said was, 
what am I going to do now? Just go home and be old. Yeah, uh, that is incredibly sad. And going back to the oh, the, the Victorian protesters that we've se- seen uh, being arrested, a lot of them are older women. And I'm not sure if you saw that footage from the, the UK anti-lockdown protests where the, uh, the British police uh, knocked down to the ground an, an elderly lady. And this is supposedly like... We're, the, the, no. the reason for these sure. lockdowns is to, to, to save granny. And I've come up with this expression. We seem to be assaulting grannies to save grannies. The, uh, the, the, uh, the, the cognitive dissidents, the... Yeah. We've also sadly seen, uh, well, during this uh, stage four lockdown, the uh, intimidation of journalists, both uh, out on the street and, and online as well. Uh, you would have seen... Uh, Avi Yemeni uh, arrested and also uh, harassed Avi by uh, Victoria Police. And I know that the usual Twitter people say, oh, he's not a, a real journalist. Well, uh, who, who should get to decide uh, who's a accredited journalist then? What, Daniel Andrews? I don't think that would be healthy uh, for democracy. But uh, we've also seen, I'm not sure if you've been following it like I have, the intense uh, online harassment, uh, bullying of uh, particularly female journalists such as Rachel and Blaxendale, who, in my opinion, should get the, the, the Golden Morkley or the, the Ed, Ed, Edward J. Morrow Award for, for journalism for, for going in there almost every day to, uh, to question uh, uh, Dan, uh, the other ones, uh, Alex White, uh, Sophie Ellsworth and, and Gabriella Power. They've been doing outstanding uh, job and social media uh, has it's just gotten so much uh, worse uh, this year and obviously it got off to a tragic start with the, the death of, of, of Wilson Gavin the, the day after he protested a, a, a drag uh, story time and I know that you uh, quit Twitter after that because it was just too toxic for mm. you still is Mm. <laughs> um, look, I, I, again, a, a, a bit of that broke up, but I got the gist of what you were saying. Um, firstly, can I just mention Avi Yemeni? I mean, it's a dangerous, dangerous world where people are designated by any government authority as being a journalist or not being a journalist. If you are reporting and you have a medium through which you're reporting, you are a journalist. You do not need a degree for that. I can tell you as someone who actually got a journalism degree, you do not need a degree to be a journalist. Um, So, uh, and he is, he works for Rebel News, which is an international news network, and yet he's treated like he's not a journalist. Uh, And regardless of whether he's a journalist or not, the treatment that's being meted out is just not right. It's it's against uh, liberty, against freedom. And I'm going to say, like the other day, I'm I'm... you know, a, a big fan of, of our police. I'm a big fan of our police. Um, you know, I, I've got some really good friends who served and are serving in the Queensland Police Force. And I, I suspect, I hope, I suspect that uh, uh, there are Victorian police officers who are, are gritting their teeth having to do what they are instructed to do. Uh, some in the upper echelons I'm not so sure about, mind you, like those that are fronting press conferences. Um, uh, but the fish rots from the head and it all starts with Daniel Andrews and the state of fear that he has turned Victoria into. And we should also mention that, well, uh, that uh, even before this uh, pandemic, uh, Victoria had its its own political prisoner in in Cardinal George Pell, who was exonerated by the the High Court, and you would say probably uh, Victoria's first refugee. He first went to, to New South Wales, and now he is uh, going back to to Rome. And that was Andrew Bolt has uh, uh, documented this uh, immensely. I interviewed on my show, well, personal friend of the Cardinal. Uh, 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 John McCauley about just how the uh, uh, the senior Victoria Police, the lengths that they went to to, to get complaints against uh, 
uh, uh, uh, George Pell and thinking it, thinking about that now, like you still think about it now because it's just so chilling that that's what they did before. Mm. Yeah, look, that's, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm almost a bit worried to even talk about it because you get piled on talking about George Pell. Um, but the reality is that um, uh, he is an innocent man um uh, people will probably again go off at me saying that but by fact of law he is an innocent yes, man and that's what i uh, said because right? in australia you are innocent until you are proven guilty and the verdict by the high court was overturned to not guilty uh, therefore he is innocent under australian law um and when you read the stories, and look, I, I didn't get deeply involved with all of it. I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a legal expert, but I did read some articles by lawyers and legal experts on what went down in the court cases. And it seems an extraordinary situation to me where you can have uh, a range of, of evidence and, and testimonies that back up your version of events. And all you need is one person on the other side to be saying, no, that's not what happened. This is what that person did without any other corroborating sort of evidence and uh, that you can be found guilty for that. Well, if that's the litmus test, oh boy, how many uh, major names could be lined up and, and, and found guilty? I mean, uh, if you have someone who, um, who says that... Uh, uh, someone committed some offence against them um, and they can pinpoint a time and a place where they both were there, but yet you have, let's say, half a dozen people that say to you, well, I was with the person, uh, we saw what went down and that didn't go down, but you can still get a guilty conviction, uh, a guilty verdict and a conviction. Uh, I just don't know that that's actually justice. That's not how justice should be should be done in this country. So it's a weird, really bizarre thing that went on there from uh, the original police case that was brought to um, to the actual decisions that were made by not just one, but two Victorian courts. Uh, so I don't understand how it all happened. I really don't. Yes, it's one of the, well, uh, sadly, uh, not the only travesty of justice in the state of Victoria recently but to mention another political prisoner and also another journalist uh julian assange uh, you've uh, been an advocate mm -hmm. for, for bringing him home you actually went to, to the uk when you were allowed to to leave australia with uh, a, a independent uh, mp andrew wilkie uh to to see julian assange and obviously uh, he's uh still yet to be be extradited but it's very clear he's almost well, more than a broken man he's almost a, a a zombie now you actually met him um mm. and this uh, we should we shouldn't forget about uh this can you just explain uh your position on him and uh, what uh, what you're advocating so I wouldn't, I wouldn't describe him, I mean, I don't know, there's been a lot of time between when I saw him and now, but at the point in time that I saw him, which was February of this year, uh, I wouldn't have described him as a zombie. He still, you know, still had a very uh, brilliant mind. And um, while he was um, articulate to a degree, while he was lucid, uh, while he was still, you know, a very, very thoughtful person, there was uh, just a lingering sense of, of disorientation that I got out of him. Um, and I guess that's what would happen if your life had got turned upside down, that you'd had to be holed up in an embassy for years on end and then uh, ripped out of it and, and put into the harshest jail in the UK. And, and potentially facing life behind bars, I guess that you would be completely and utterly disoriented, um, you know, as a, as a person. But look, my, my stance on that just comes back to the whole freedom thing. I mean, this guy is a journalist. Um, he is someone who collects information and reports on this information, uh, you know, within, within uh, reason. 
He does not um, seek to alter the information greatly that he receives. So he is more of a purist in terms of a journalist and a reporter than a lot of the fake news mob out there who uh, skew, skew the news and twist it and, and put all sorts of slants and bias into it. He takes the facts and he republishes the facts as they are. Now, um, he was in receipt of, of data that, uh, that, a, that a person, um, namely uh, Bradley Manning, now Chelsea Manning, um, that a person took from the US Defence Department and made available to him, and that person committed a crime. So I have not been out there saying that this Manning should be vindicated, should be, um, you know, pardoned or, or, or exonerated or whatever. Uh, that person did commit a crime under US law, on US soil. Julian Assange was in receipt of that information. He didn't steal it. And he's not a US citizen. He's not a US subject. Uh, he was not in the United States when he received that information. And my question really is, I couldn't care whether it was the US or China or Zimbabwe or, or, or wherever. You know, are the laws of a country now to apply to people all over the planet? You know, and how dangerous is that going to be? He's an Australian citizen. And I'm sorry, but the laws of a foreign nation should should not apply to you unless you are reaching into that country. I mean, I can understand if you're doing something over the internet, but he wasn't doing that. He received something. So, you know, uh, again, for freedom. It's you, like... You just uh, can't support him to arrest. Uh, and his extradition, you can't. It's like if uh, uh, Victoria Police uh, tried to extradite yourself and, and, and Craig Kelly uh, to, to, <laughs> to uh, face incitement charges in uh, Victoria no. for, uh, well, at the very least, sympathising with uh, the anti-lockdown protests. Don't, don't, don't give them ideas. Yes. Do not give them ideas. <laughs> and, and speaking of the, the, the pair of you, you've both been... Well, I, I shouldn't say outspoken. You've just spoken about uh, or oh, the the drug that shall not be named hydroxychloroquine, uh, which is it's not just listed as a or a banned and yeah. a poison in, in Queensland, but also here in Victoria. And uh, you uh, have you and Craig uh, published a, an open letter on That's the. Right. Uh, well, you published it on. You obviously sent it to her. You published it on your, your Facebook pages, uh, but you also published mm -hmm. it uh, on the on the good source. I'll just bring it up here for 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 our audience. And you've also it's got awesome. uh, a petition uh, here yeah. uh, as well. And can I just get your opinion uh, on why this drug is apparently so demonised? Is it simply from the fact that? Uh, Donald Trump has spoken highly of it and has taken it. Like, I sometimes wonder if he'd never mentioned it, would the, the timeline be different? Yeah. T Tim, you really badly broke up then, but uh, I'll just speak in general to the, uh, to the hydroxychloroquine letter. So, um, so, sorry about that, mate. It just really, I couldn't, couldn't hear uh, much of what was just said. But um, we've written this letter to the Chief Health Officer She's got a ban currently against um, doctors using hydroxychloroquine in Queensland as a treatment for uh, patients who may have COVID-19 or maybe wanting to take it, I guess, as a preventative for COVID-19. Um, and, you know, we're not doctors. We're not out there saying that hydroxychloroquine works. What we're saying is have a look at the studies out there and there are plenty of them which actually says that maybe it works in fact, in a lot of cases, there's proven benefits. Uh, and the studies out there that are saying it is not dangerous. So it, it is, uh, it's actually law in Australia. It, it, it's completely lawful for doctors to prescribe medicines to people off-label. It happens all the time. So a doctor comes across a particular treatment that may work, that in their view is not dangerous, and they can say to their patient, right, I'm going to run you on a course of this drug and this drug. So they prescribe it, 
uh, they, they say to them, this is how the doses are going to be administered, and away they go and do it. Um, that's been completely and utterly lawful up until now, where suddenly this hydroxychloroquine is this dangerous and deadly drug, even though it's used for uh, a range of autoimmune problems, lupus, it's used uh, for malaria, uh, it's been used for yonks, but now it's the worst thing. And I can only think that really, really is based upon the fact that a certain man that lives in a certain avenue in Washington <laughs> in the USA uh, might have touted its benefits. If he hadn't have done that, we wouldn't have seen any of the hysteria because there's a doctor in Australia that's actually promoting a similar treatment for another drug called uh, ivermectin, I think it is. Um, it's, it does a similar thing, in fact, and he's, he's uh, putting forward a similar sort of medical treatment or medical protocol uh, where this drug can be used off-label. And uh, I'm going to say he's probably hoping like hell that President Trump doesn't say anything about that because it'll probably end up being banned too. But that's actually happening quite lawfully in the country. And what's happening also quite lawfully in the country right now is there is a, there is a trial. You can go and have a look. It's called COVID Shield, a trial going on to test out whether, surprise, surprise, hydroxychloroquine uh, is worthwhile as a preventative measure for healthcare workers. And um, they're apparently seeing some success with it. Yes, uh, there, there's one that's happening at the, the local, I think it's, uh, uh, I, uh, I, w I won't say the, the hospital in case I get it wrong, but one of the, the local hospitals here but uh, don't forget that here in australia clive palmer is also an advocate for hydroxychloroquine yeah. takes it himself and has got a announced a, a stockpile he takes himself, for it. I know that. well that's, that's what he uh, told andrew bolt uh, recently and also uh he uh is challenging the the constitutionality of these uh, state border closures uh as well the the case will be be heard at no in november I know that uh, the, the Morrison government uh, was originally supporting it, uh, but uh, when the, the second wave happened here in, in Melbourne, they withdraw their support. No. But it certainly uh, it's, needs to be decided uh, by a high court whether what all our uh, state and territory leaders have been doing with the various border closures is actually lawful and i've spoken to your uh good source uh, colleague uh professor david flint about this much yep. uh, expert in the the constitution much more than uh, the, uh, uh than you and i and he says there's a strong case uh for for striking down these border closures yeah there, there quite clearly is i wish i had the constitution in front of me to to uh, read out the section in it but, but there, there is a, a section in the constitution which uh it clearly refers to free movement of goods and services, uh, free and, and uh, I'm not sure whether it says unfettered carriage, but uh, basically that's what it, uh, it insinuates, that um, there shall be no strictures on the movement of people or products uh, from state to state here in Australia. We are one nation. So, <laughs> I mean, it might be very popular in some quarters to do it, but uh, whether or not it's popular... Uh, is it against the law and that needs to be tested. I think there's going to be a good case. I think there may be there may be some uh, legal argument that certain restrictions or certain requirements may have to happen in times of pandemic in order to cross uh, one border to another. but um, uh, I can I can I can assure you the carte blanche rule that you can set, just lock down a border will just not be allowed. It will not be allowed. The Constitution does not allow it. And I go one step further to say that I, I really do hope that people who have been subject to the most egregious abuses of their freedom and liberty uh, have lawyers that come forward to argue the case for them. And I know in certain circumstances that's already happened. Avi Yemeni, um, the young mother who was arrested Sorry, uh, in her house. Sorry, Bula, yep. Um, so, so these cases also need to be taken to the highest court in the land uh, to actually see whether there has been freedoms trampled upon 
to ensure that it can never, ever happen again. And I've got to tell you, if they go to the highest court in the land, the highest court says, well, you know what? It was allowed to be done. Then maybe you might have, it might have just converted me to the cause of a Bill of Rights. It may have just converted me to the cause of a Bill of Rights, if that's the case, because you can't have a situation where government, for whatever reasons, can just ride roughshod over your God-given human rights. It just cannot happen. Your, your God-given freedom, uh, that is sacrosanct. We're not here as a people to serve the government. That is not how democracy in this country works. The government is there and government authorities are there as public servants to do what the word says, serve us, the public. So um, someone's got this really, really wrong in how they're rolling out all of these restrictions. Uh, we've been going for just over a, uh, an hour now. I know I had you booked for an hour. I, I still do want That's to right. discuss uh, Australia uh, 2021 if you're you're happy to keep going for, for a bit. Yeah, hour. I can probably talk for another five minutes and then I will have to go. Yep, yeah, go ahead. Because as you said, you've got uh, uh, important uh, constituent work to do. But uh, Australia 2021, obviously the, uh, the Morrison government did pretty good job locking in those two potential uh, vaccines, the Oxford and University of, of Queensland. Uh, you uh, lobbied for it to be voluntary, uh, which uh, I know was a, a concern for uh, a lot of people. Are you satisfied with the assurances? Uh, yes, and look, uh, I wanted it to be voluntary, but I, I didn't lobby for it. I didn't need to lobby for it because um, straight away, uh, the Prime Minister, uh, you know, after it was uh, reported that he said it was going to be compulsory, he came out and said, no, it's not going to be compulsory, it will be voluntary. Um, and I take him at his word on that. Uh, there is no uh, compulsion and there will be no compulsion over any vaccine. I'm a bit sceptical about the prospects of a vaccine, though. I mean, everyone was talking about the... Uh, the main the main one that was being done over in Oxford... Uh, uh, AstraZeneca, I think it was, uh, and suddenly um, this was the shining light and now it's not because there's some um, problem that's turned out. I was talking to the CEO of a major pathology company in Australia who said to me that, uh, you know, most vaccines, they take ages to develop if they are to have any efficacy and even ones that have been, uh, that, that the years and years and years have been undertaken in order to get them right some of them are still only 60% effective. So um, I've got some doubts about it. Uh, obviously, if, uh, as I said in my, my introduction, uh, Australia is going to have its, its hardest uh, uh, decade. And a lot of people have commented, given that, well, the, the Federal Biosecurity mm -hmm. Act has uh, banned Australians travelling overseas and people coming to Australia mm -hmm. unless an exemption uh, applies, and given that we have seen the the negative coverage of or well, combination of both the Australia uh, Australian police state uh, and nanny state, even though we've seen years of uh, immigration population growth, demographers are actually predicting a, a decrease next year. Because why would businesses want to invest in in a country which is so massively constantly interfered with people's lives? shut uh, so, so many businesses and Australia and New Zealand could once again be the nations uh, uh, that are at the mercy of the, the tyranny of, of distance. Uh, obviously, there's been a lot of talk about the Australian population potentially uh, dispersing into the, the regions and there's been a lot of speculations during the, well, when uh, seven out of the state, eight uh, state and territory leaders have agreed to open the borders by Christmas, whether we'll have a lot of Victorians fleeing uh, during the summer window. <laughs> or, uh, for example... Fleeing if, forever, yeah, probably. Would you encourage uh, uh, Victorians, uh, when uh, when they're able to do so, to migrate to Mackay? Oh, well, look, uh, we need workers in Mackay, that's for sure. And uh, uh, there's, a, there's uh, probably a few empty uh, homes for sale or empty homes that could... Uh, use people in them and um, we could do with uh, with the population up here that's for sure yeah yeah I would encourage that um, uh, 
but uh, can I just say that on the international borders, um, look, you know, th this is about the only measure I really do think, apart from washing your hands and maybe a bit of social distancing, okay, um, the lock, the 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 fourteen day mandatory quarantine period is about the only measure that has really stopped uh, transmission within Australia. Uh, uh, most other things, apart from the washing the hand, apart from a bit of social distancing, most other things are just window dressing. Um, so uh, uh, that really has has uh, saved us. And I think that, um, you know, again, we can't just keep the borders, the international borders, completely locked down. It's going to have to be managed, uh, but while the virus is prevalent in other parts of the world um, we're probably going to have to keep some sort of quarantine measure in play um, and if you want to travel around the world well i guess adding on an extra two weeks and your return journey back to australia is just going to have to be something that you do um, uh, you know that that, that uh, uh, but, but it's going to have to be managed uh, I know that uh, Scott Morrison, he wants to transition away from hotel, a mandatory hotel quarantine, which is very expensive, back to, to home uh, qu quarantine, yeah. which is uh, much more affordable. And there's talk about this rapid coronavirus saliva testing, which obviously, I don't know how many times you've been tested for coronavirus with the nose poke and, and down the, the throat. Yeah, I've got mm. But uh, obviously, uh, doing the saliva uh, test uh, with the 20-minute turnover, that would allow uh, much more, high, a higher turnaround if the, we have to live with this virus for yeah. testing. And sh sure, that's going to be great. If, if the technology is there to actually rapid test people, um, so you can go and sit in a, in a waiting lounge in an airport for uh, half an hour, uh, you know, after getting your test, that's great um, because, again, the facts just say that if the person is going to test negative to it and the person is asymptomatic, well, they're not going to be able to spread anything anyway, so they should be able to just go back on a flight home if they need to fly home again or go into their normal place of residence if they live in the capital city that they internationally flew into. And, um, yeah, if you really, really, really want to have some other measure, make him self-quarantined at home or self-isolated at home for the two weeks just to be on the safe side. Um, but these things can be worked out and they will be worked out. Uh, as I say, it's going to have to be managed and that management means as we become aware of new technologies, uh, new breakthroughs and testing, uh, and we have the ability to roll them out that we do that and we, we manage the process and don't have stuff-ups like what had down, happened down in Victoria. Yes, it is. Oh, it's no exaggeration to say it's the greatest public policy failure in at least Victoria's history, if not uh, uh, Australia. I just want to uh, sneak in one last question. Scott Morrison announced uh, yep. a furthering of the, the digital revolution because probably the, the work from home uh, will, uh, will be a... A permanent feature uh, going forward, regardless of if there's a vaccine. Just people, uh, it's because uh, people have learnt that it's uh, more viable now. And uh, we heard the announcement of the the NBN upgrade. Obviously, there's the five G rollout uh, continuing, which we've had a few technical difficulties during this uh, this show. Uh, so certainly, both of those developments Thanks, are, are welcome. And uh, also. Well, uh, if we're all going to be uh, in our different homes, we're going to need a bit more uh, of that coal uh, or to use or, or gas, yeah, as yeah. Uh, Scott Morrison's been been advocating. Yeah, for sure. And look, um, I think it'll work in some instances. This work from home routine, in others, it won't. Um, you know, it's going to be horses for courses. But uh, you're right. If more people are going to be at home, uh, it's going to be. Um, more need to have the home fires burning, and that means uh, more coal. And we've got plenty of it. We've also got plenty of uh, uranium <laughs> as well. We've got so many minerals here. We just need just need to let uh, the, the the miners dig it out. 
we could have uh, a, a massive energy revolution in Australia uh, of the kind that the US had. If only, um, the, you know, we can do things environmentally sound, but the, the ridiculous strictures, the ideological strictures need to be taken off uh, the sector and we would have job, a jobs boom and we would also have cheap energy because it's not. It shouldn't just be about uh, digging the stuff out of the ground or uh, pumping it uh, uh, out of wells or whatever. It should be uh, also about using it for our own national benefit as well. Uh, they do that in the US so so well, so so well, but uh, not so well here in Australia. Well, I'll I'll let you go now. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank for you very much, giving, Tim. giving me your, your your time tonight. And, and yeah, uh, keep uh, just you know, check that list to make sure I don't get in trouble from the journalists. Yes, yes. Make sure you email not it neo -Nazi, straight back. Not a racist. Not a conspiracy theorist. Thank thank you. I'll because they're probably sure all watching okay. uh, this. And Thanks very much. Monitoring. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows. And to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.